Only the bravest of us would ever even dare to seriously consider attempting to summit the legendary Mount Everest. The mountain's death zone has claimed the lives of over 300 adventurers, and about 100 of their bodies remain, each with their own story to tell. Some of the most epic tales end with the hero losing his life in the battle, but his legacy lives on. Many have heard of George Lay Mallory, or Green Boots, the body that has become a landmark for Everest climbers. But there are many others whose stories are lesser known. In this episode of Vivid Crackle, we will be looking at the strange life and death of the madman of Everest, Maurice Wilson. Born in 1898 in West Yorkshire, England, Maurice was a man of courage from the beginning. He joined the British Army on his 18th birthday, and in 1917 he was sent to France to fight in World War I. In 1918, during the Battle of Ypres, where an estimated 250,000 men were killed, his entire unit was either injured or killed all around him. He hadn't been hit yet, so he stood alone and defended the surviving men and held the position. He fought against the Germans who were coming from both flanks and hitting him hard with mortar shells and machine gun fire. He somehow survived and was awarded the military cross and was promoted to captain and then sent right back to the exact same spot where he was once again caught up in the same kind of fight. This time though, he got hit multiple times by machine gun fire in the chest and his left arm. He survived, but was left with permanent damage and pain in the arm. At some point in all of this, he had a bad parachute landing that damaged his knee and left him with weakness there as well. After that, Maurice simply wasn't the same. Today, we would say he had PTSD and he could get some kind of help, but back then they didn't understand the effects of war very well. So people like Maurice were just told to walk it off. And if they couldn't walk it off, they were put in insane asylums and diagnosed with shell shock. He decided he needed to find purpose in his life, so he became a wanderer. For the next several years, he traveled and had all kinds of jobs in London, New Zealand, and San Francisco. It turned out he was a natural businessman. He made a lot of money in his endeavors. He owned a dress shop, he became a farmer for a while, and even sold a sort of snake oil that was several ingredients mixed with opium and alcohol, which is believed to have helped him with his constant knee and arm pain. Despite his success, and probably because he was hooked on opium and alcohol, Maurice's health and personal life continued to spiral. He developed a nasty cough that was believed to be a type of tuberculosis. He was married and divorced twice, and it all came to a head in London where he had a total nervous breakdown. Just when it seemed like things couldn't possibly get any worse in Maurice's life, everything took an incredible turn. In 1932, he met a mysterious mystic in Mayfair, a wealthy part of London. While Maurice talked quite a bit about this man, he never named him or gave any real details on who he was. As a matter of fact, some people doubt he even ever existed. However, this mystic told Maurice that the answer to all of his problems was faith in God, prayer, and fasting. With no other options, Maurice decided to follow the mystic's advice and went through a very secretive 35 days of total fasting and prayer. When it was over, all of his sickness was gone and he came out of the experience with an entirely new sense of purpose. He had been fascinated with the idea of climbing Mount Everest for a long time time, but it had always been an impossible journey with his health being what it was. So now, convinced of the power of prayer and faith, Maurice believed that climbing Mount Everest was now his calling, in order to prove to the world that prayer and fasting really work. He said it was the job I was given to do, but that wasn't enough. He couldn't have a team or help or anyone else that could claim that they got him to the top. He said, I'll show the world what faith can do. I'll perform a task so hard and so exacting that it could only be carried out by someone aided with divine help. I'll climb Mount Everest alone. He had never climbed anything of note in his life. He had never worn a crampon. He had never used an ice axe, but he was convinced he was the chosen one for this task. Oh, 
He also didn't bother going through any kind of training or attempt to climb any mountains. The most training he undertook was casually walking through the rolling hills of Snowdonia in Wales. The clincher to all of this madness was his plan of entry for Everest. Maurice's plan was to fly a plane from southern London to Tibet, crash land the plane on Everest's upper slopes, and then climb alone with his sparse equipment and mirror so he could signal the people below what his progress was. Also, he wasn't a pilot and had no idea how to fly a plane. He did go through flight school and was a terrible student. It took him double the normal amount of time to learn to fly, and his teacher very specifically warned him that he was so terrible that if he did attempt to fly to Everest, he was definitely going to crash and die. But in true Maurice fashion, he disregarded all of the very reasonable advice he was given and purchased a three-year-old De Havilland Gypsy Moth from the Scarborough Flying Circus. He got a great deal for it because it was damaged, which is not exactly ideal for a flight to Everest, but he painted it and called it the Everest. He almost immediately crashed the Everest, which delayed his trip to Everest by three weeks, although certainly didn't dampen his spirits. The Air Ministry of Britain heard about Maurice's insane plan and commanded him not to attempt the flight to Tibet, which he of course ignored, and once the Everest was repaired, he made a break for Everest. He made multiple stops, and at each one, the governments and officials tried to keep him from continuing. In Cairo, they told him he was forbidden from moving on in his journey, and that he wouldn't be allowed to fly any further. Being the incredible salesman that he was, Maurice convinced them that he would just make his back to Britain then. They let him take off in the Everest, and he pretended to fly toward Britain, only to suddenly change course and continue toward Mount Everest. He amazingly made it to India. And it seemed like his incredible plan to crash land on Everest might actually work until the officials there caught wind of the plan and told him Nepal airspace was restricted. They impounded the Everest and told him he wouldn't be allowed to climb the mountain. So, Maurice did the logical thing, found some Sherpas, dressed as a Buddhist monk, pretended to be deaf and dumb, and snuck into Nepal and made it to Everest. He made his way with the Sherpas to the Rongbuk Monastery, where he was welcomed and he made that his base camp. It should be noted that in accordance with Maurice's belief in prayer and fasting, his plan was to scale Everest only eating one meal a day, with some dates to snack on in between. He spent two days resting before venturing out on his own with almost no equipment. He spent three days wandering through the ice labyrinth, and according to his diary, he got lost over and over again. When he finally arrived at Camp 2, low on supplies, not really equipped at all, and exhausted, he went through what he could find there. He discovered a pair of crampons, which is an essential piece of gear that would have been a huge help, but he tossed them to the side because they weren't edible. The next day a blizzard hit. He spent the entire day fighting it and only made it 250 vertical feet, he wrote in his journal. Discretion is the better part of valor. It's the weather that has beaten me. What bad luck. So he turned back. It took him four grueling days to make it back to the monastery. He had lost the battle, but the war was not over. He spent 18 days recovering and made plans to go back up. When he set out again, he took two of the Sherpas that had traveled with him before to give him a little boost and guide him further up before he would set out again on his own. After all, he was originally going to crash land near the top, so a little help wasn't going against what he believed, right? They made it to Camp 3 in just three days and found a ton of food there abandoned by the expedition before them. It was there when Maurice found a box of King George chocolates along with some other foods that he abandoned his fasting and decided to feast. Another blizzard hit, which forced them to remain in camp, but eventually Maurice grew restless and wanted to continue. The Sherpas refused and eventually abandoned him, so he set out on his own. His last journal entry read, Off again, gorgeous day. His body was found a year later, at the bottom of a sheer vertical wall of ice he had attempted and failed to climb. His knees were drawn to his chest where he lay. Apparently, he had gotten hot in all of his equipment because he wasn't wearing his coat, just a light jumper, and thin flannel pants and thin socks. And without a doubt that, along with incredible ignorance and lack of experience and being alone, is what finally killed him.